So I'm gonna get started. I'm gonna get started because I start with the introduction and the housekeeping so people still have a few minutes to join. So yeah, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Soha Youssef and I'm uh, convening the seminar series on behalf of UNU Merit and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. The migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and others to discuss their work related to migration. Before I will introduce today's speaker, uh, there are some uh, housekeeping that I'd like uh, to do. Uh, our speaker's talk will last approximately for 40 minutes, after which 20 minutes are um, for discussion and questions uh, from the audience. I'd like to ask you to please keep your questions until after the presentation. You can either put uh, the question in the chat box and I'll read it out loud for you, or you can also drop your message by the chat box, uh, or you can raise your hand, use the raise your hand uh, button and uh, ask your question. Uh, I will allocate turns and you can ask your question right away. Uh, please, in the meantime, keep your microphones on mute. Uh, your camera can be turned on if you would like to, but please be aware that we're recording this seminar for distribution on our uh, YouTube channel later. Uh, on our YouTube channel, you can also find the recordings of previous seminar uh, series in, uh, in the past. And now that we're done with the housekeeping, let me introduce our speaker. So welcome back to Loxan Harley. Loxan Harley is an independent migration specialist and executive director of, of Homeland uh, Advisory based in the UK. He has extensive experience supporting the United Nations governments and nonprofits through migration related research, project management, capacity building and technical assistance across Europe, Africa and Asia Pacific. He holds a BA in economics from Miguel University and a master's uh, degree in public policy and management from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, where he has also lectured on migration policy. And with that said, let me uh, give the floor then to Loxan. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, always a pleasure to be uh, speaking with you and you merits um, uh, very switched on smart students. Um, so yeah, uh, bef as we get going, what I'd really love is if um, you could type, if those of you who are following could type in the chat, um, perhaps the diaspora, a diaspora that you identify with. Um, and you know, you, you don't have to limit yourself to one, you may be part of uh, several diasporas. Um, and as we'll talk later on, you know, your diaspora can, you can be a diaspora of a country, you can be a diaspora of a specific region or locality. Um, and you can also be, you know, we can also stretch out that definition of diaspora to also include things like sports teams or any kind of affiliation, if, if, if we so wish. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, why that is. But anyway, today's seminar is entitled Immigration's Flip Side, Engaging Diaspora Capital Transfers. Um, and, you know, we talk about, um, you know, I decided to, to use this term immigration's flip side because I feel often migration, uh, when we talk about migration, uh, we it's often understood to mean immigration, you know, uh, migration, especially here. Well, especially I, I was going to say here in Europe, I'm currently in South Africa, but um, generally in Europe, when we talk about migration, I feel we're often talking about um, immigration much more than emigration. So um, and and a lot of that, you know, unfortunately comes with a lot of the negative aspects of the of the immigration debate, um, you know, the, uh, how we emphasize uh, sovereignty and um, control, uh, whereas diaspora is immigration's flip side. It's about um, you know the the it's usually about the developmental side of of how communities, migrant communities, when they are abroad, how they then uh, contribute or can contribute back to their homelands. Um, anyway, so that's setting the scene a little bit. Let's see. OK, we've got some we've got American diaspora, German diaspora, Kenyan diaspora, Egyptian diaspora. Great. Any um, localities as well? You know, are there any specific uh, regions or localities that you, you're particularly attached to? I'd be interested to, to hear uh, German Beninese diaspora. Excellent. Um, so you'll see this slide on your screen um, entitled Mayo Joe. Uh, so uh, you, I, I'm sure many of you may already know that President Joe Biden 
uh, identifies very much as part of the Irish diaspora. Um, and this is a picture of Joe Biden during his recent uh, tour of, of the Republic of Ireland, of the island of Ireland. Um, and in it, he returned, quote unquote, returned to his community of heritage uh, in County Mayo in the, in the town of Ballina. And he was welcomed with uh, a lot of fanfare, Irish dancing, and uh, and you know he's you can see him here on a stage uh, in front of the kind of biggest landmark in the town. And he said uh, during his speech, you know, it means the world to me. Um, it meant the world to me and my entire family to be embraced as Mayo Joe, son of Bellina. Um, and I wanted to share that. Uh, story with you for a few reasons. Um, you know, one is it just really demonstrates that the power of diaspora engagement, um, especially from the perspective of the, the the community or country of origin. So Ireland clearly benefits greatly from having um, someone from its diaspora as, uh, you know, arguably the, the most powerful person in the world. Um, it, it matters to Ireland's soft power. Um, it matters. It matters in terms of of, of real power. Um, you know, we've seen how uh, the president has been particularly engaged in in uh, the the politics of Ireland and in um, you know uh, issues of Brexit and 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 others. And what it also demonstrates, I think, is that uh, diaspora engagement is not formed or diaspora. Um, attachments are not formed in a vacuum. Uh, and what I mean by that is this. Uh, Joe, President Joe Biden is very famously a member of the um, Irish diaspora and the County Mayo diaspora in Ireland. Uh, but he's also, if you actually research his heritage, uh, he is equally English and he's actually from my county of Sussex in, in England. Uh, uh, yet you don't hear that very often. And, and you know, Part of that, you could say, is is perhaps down to just him personally having that stronger connection with one side of his family or, or certain parts of his his heritage. Um, another, I would say, is that Ireland has been very purposeful, uh, very intentional with its diaspora engagement approach, with its diaspora engagement policies. Um, and Ireland is one of the, the leaders. Um, the government of Ireland is one of the leaders in diaspora engagement. And, and we'll, you know, they'll pop up in this uh, seminar as well. Um, so uh, I believe that there's clearly this ability to influence uh, the the attachments, uh, the affinities, the sense of belonging that diasporas feel, and you know, therefore ben benefit your own country or your own locality. Uh, and that also gives you a sense of the uh, perspective um, with which I approach this seminar. Um, you know, as as uh, as was said during the introduction, uh, my work is very much as a practitioner, as a as an independent consultant working with governments. Um, and on the topic of diaspora engagement, I work mainly with governments of countries of origin. Um, so that's the perspective um, that I'm approaching this with. Um, also, I'd like to just encourage you uh, folks as well to, if you ever have any questions, um, you know, uh, type type something in the chat uh, or, or put your hand up. I can't actually um, both look at my slides and um, kind of see everyone's faces. So if you have a question, please feel free to also just un unmute yourself and ask directly. Um, you know, I want to make this interactive. And so in today's seminar, what we will look to do is to identify those linkages between diasporas and development, uh, to review the frameworks for diaspora engagement, um, especially you know, from the perspective of the, the governments that, that I support. Um, and we'll look at real world policy issues and engagement practices, so specific types of initiatives that um, countries have used to engage their diasporas. Um, and we'll also look to critically reflect on the roles of government and other stakeholders in engaging diasporas too. Um, I'm trying to make this a bit a uh, one-size-fits-all seminar. I've heard that some of you may be familiar with diaspora engagement already, others uh, not so much. So hopefully I can. there's going to be something for everyone here. 
Um, and also, if there's, uh, you know, if there's something else that you'd like to get out of this um, seminar, uh, type that in the chat as well. If, if there are any learning objectives that you want to add, I'd be really glad to hear them. And then I'll try to address those uh, through the seminar as well. So I've, I've already been introduced, so I won't bore you too much about myself. I would just add a few things that, that weren't mentioned. So, so one is, you know, my own migration and diaspora background. So uh, I'm, I was born in the UK and brought up in the UK. And uh, my mother's Chinese, Hong Kong Chinese. And I also, from the age of 18 to 28, 29, uh, lived in uh, quite a few different countries, Canada, Belgium, um, China, uh, India, um, Burkina Faso. And uh, so that I, I'm not just flexing here. I, there's a point to that. So one is that, you know, I have my own um, diaspora background, right? So I consider myself a member of the uh, Chinese diaspora, a member of the Hong Kong diaspora. And uh, that led me to do my own diaspora return to China, uh, where I lived for, for over three years um, as an adult. Um, and then of, obviously, whilst I was abroad, I considered myself very much part of the UK diaspora, even though we don't really say the word diaspora in the UK, we tend to um, talk more about uh, being Brits abroad. Um, so yeah, I was a Brit abroad for, for several years as well. And then I made my diaspora return to the UK. Um, so, you know, I think all of us who work in the field of migration, we're always informed by our, our own um, uh, stories of, of migration and, and um, heritage. Uh, I'd also like to mention that, um, you know, uh, well, uh, when we talk about diaspora, as I said, it doesn't have to be limited to 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 country, right? So it can also be locality. So um, I also consider myself as um, from the county of Sussex in in the UK, um, and uh, so that's also part of uh, when I travel abroad. That's that's something that's dear to my heart as well. When I meet others from the county, it's um, you know we we share some interesting conversations and so on, and can relate to each other in a certain way. Um, yeah, just a couple of other things. I've probably already done 60 seconds about me, but, uh, um, you know, uh, I'm, I also host a, a, a podcast called the Migration and Diaspora podcast. Um, Professor Siegel, who's uh, at the seminar, she's she's been on the podcast as well. And you can find that at um, homelandsadvisory.com forward slash podcast um, if you're not too bored of, of hearing from my, from me already. So uh, let's talk about diaspora engagement and how diasporas contribute to development. Um, so how do we define diaspora, first of all? So I keep we keep coming back to this term diaspora. Uh, I think when I first heard that word, I, I thought, you know, what is it and how can I avoid catching it? Um, it does. It, it, it is a bit of a funny term. Um, can someone type into the chat? You know, what, what do you what do you think we mean by um, diaspora? Um, and I'd also, whilst you're hopefully um, helping me with this definition, uh, I'd also note that um, the term diaspora, uh, it's it's understood differently in different countries. And um, a lot of countries don't use the term diaspora at all. Uh, for others, it's very much part of, um, you know, uh, common common speech. Um, you know, I've been to, and, and I've even been to some countries where diaspora can have uh, a negative connotation. Um, you know, I'm thinking about my time uh, back living in Burkina Faso and uh, uh, the Burkina Bay who had grown up in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire in the Ivory Coast and then returned um, were often referred to as the di diaspora in a, in a negative way. Um, and as I said, uh, in, in my country, in the UK, uh, the word diaspora is a bit more academic it's not commonly used um and uh, you know amongst a lot of european uh, countries um it's not common to say it's definitely not common to say i'm part of the uk diaspora i don't think it's common to say i'm part of the french uh, diaspora um uh, or american diaspora i know um, professor siegel identified as part of the american diaspora and um, i mean when we talk academically there clearly is an, a, a u.s diaspora 
Um, but uh, I don't usually hear people use the term American diaspora uh, on a daily basis. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Tobias has given us the um, definition of community of emigrants. Uh, well, I'll, I should skip back to, to not reveal the um, dictionary definition. Uh, so Tobias has said community of emigrants from the same origin country or region with ties to that origin country. Yeah. Emmanuel has said migrants living outside their countries, but maintaining the attachment and a sense of belonging to their countries of origin um, and has a commitment to contribute to their um, economic development. Um, OK, yeah, but I mean, both definitely have very um, uh, common uh, threads there, I think. You know, there's that sense of belonging, that that common identity, um, and and you know, we're talking about um, um, you know immigrants or migrants as well. Uh, I'll give you the definition that is um, that is in the I the International Organization for Migration (IOM's) glossary, which is migrants or descendants of migrants whose identity and sense of belonging, either real or symbolic, have been shaped by their migration experience and background. They maintain links with their homelands and to each other based on a shared sense of history, identity or mutual experiences in the destination country. So, I mean, to simplify it, it's it's, you know, migrants and their descendants. So it, it doesn't have to be a national of a specific country or, or, or someone who has specific papers that relate to to, to, to a given country or locality. Um, it, it can be uh, it can be a later generation person. So someone, as, as I said, I don't have any um, I don't have a Chinese passport or any kind of identity documents proving that I'm Chinese. Um, but I consider myself as part of the Chinese diaspora, a later generation member of the Chinese diaspora. Um, you know, also you'll see in the definition that it, it talks about this sense of belonging, either real or symbolic. Um, so, you know, you can think of uh, how there are plenty of um, uh, people in the United States, for example, who might might have a tiny link to um, a country like Ireland, uh, but but very much um, feel that connection and 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 feel that sense of belonging. Um, so uh, you know, and that and that might just be a symbolic sense of belonging. Someone also told me before that, um, you know, if, if you want to stretch that definition of diaspora, um, you can also stretch it to things like football teams. So um, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to share uh, a, 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 a sports team that they feel very strongly about. But for myself, uh, you know, I'm a Tottenham Hotspur fan. If anyone knows the English uh, Premier League um, football uh, and there is a sense of, you know, when you meet another Tottenham Hotspur fan um, in the world, you have that immediate connection, you know, and that shared um, that shared sense of belonging in some ways. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, and I think university alumni um, could also be considered uh, diasporas in, in some way as well. Um, but anyway, and and also just to uh, finish um, the point on this, uh, you know, as that definition recognizes, you you that sense of belonging. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily come from um, heritage or, or 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 nationality. It can also be, um, you know, a, a sort of um, how do we term it? Uh, you can also have a connection to a place uh, based on having just been there a lot and um, having had a lot of experiences there. You know, so. Uh, uh, for myself, as I lived in Burkina Faso for for quite a while, I consider myself in some ways an, uh, a friend of Burkina for life. Um, um, you know, and, and some of the other countries I've lived in, I also have very strong connections to. Uh, and that's that's a, a relevant point because, for instance, when I've worked with other countries, when I've worked with governments on diaspora engagement, um, I'm always very keen to not only uh, try to engage, um, you know, the those nationals who are living abroad and their descendants, but also friends of the country, those who have that connection, um, either through having been there a lot, through having um, close friends or family from that country, um, or otherwise, you know, so diaspora engagement uh, is is really about trying to um, uh, capitalize on 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 um on this sense of belonging and and these uh, uh, affinities that people feel to two different countries 
Um, we don't have to limit ourselves to um, kind of uh, definitions of nationality and so on. Okay, next slide. Uh, and also just to mention, um, you know, diaspora, um, you know, the term diaspora, it, the, there's the etymology behind it as well, which comes from uh, the Greek language and and kind of embodies meanings of um, scattering and, and dispersal of people. Okay, so let's talk about some of the linkages between um, migration, uh, well, between diaspora engagement um, and and development. Uh, so there's a few different um, ways of thinking about it. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this model, which is looking at kind of development challenges and opportunities at different stages of the migration cycle. Um, so often when we talk about um, the stages of migration, we talk about um, uh, starting off the migrant starts off at the at their community of origin. They then transit another community to get to their destination or their community of residence. And then later on, they may return. Um, and this is a useful model because, uh, you know, you can think of it from the perspective of the migrant and you can also think from the perspective of the community, right? So the, the perspective of the um, origin community, transit community, destination community or return community. Um, I often use the term community instead of country because as as we've talked about, you know, when we talk about diaspora engagement, you can be a diaspora of um, not only a country, but a specific place as well. So um, in terms of, uh, it, you know, it, as I said, there's different ways of thinking about this. So if we think about the um, development opportunities and challenges from the perspective of the migrant or diaspora member themselves, uh, you can think about how once, once they arrive in their community of destination, once they become an emigrant, um, they're not only contributing and, um, you know, uh, unlocking opportunities for themselves and their destination community once they get there, uh, you know, either through getting a job or through, um, uh, you know, investing and starting a business, uh, but they also can contribute very much to their co community of origin. Um, and they can do so through um, sending money home, uh, through um, transmitting values or, or habits or information or networks back home as well. Um, and uh, and you know so so that's from the perspective of the migrant uh, uh, transmitting their capitals back home, um, and then of course once they that person returns home, uh, they can also bring all the skills, all the all the in, in capital, all the other capitals that they've acquired whilst abroad, um, they can bring that back home as well, and and those can be um, positive uh, developmental benefits um, to their communities as well. Uh, there's also the challenges, um, because in diaspora engagement, whilst a lot of emphasis is on how to unlock the capital transfers from diaspora back to their communities of origin, um, there's also challenges for the um, for the diaspora member themselves, right? So when they get to their community of destination, their community of residence, uh, they may have trouble integrating, they may face loneliness, they may um, also fail to have their skills adequately recognized, which means they may not get a job that equates to their skill level, um, which can lead to, you know, skill loss. Um, and also when they return home, they may face reintegration challenges. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, in a lot of countries that I've worked in, um, members of the diaspora can be viewed with uh, suspicion or viewed negatively by the um, population uh, of the homeland of their home community. Um, you know, so when they come back, they may be viewed as uh, uh, not necessarily favorably, and that can also um, uh, constrain their their um, their contribution to development. Yeah. I heard some voices. Someone would someone like Sorry, to ask a question? I... I unmute. I think it was someone that unmuted themselves by mistake because it was background noise, uh, and I okay. muted everyone. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, no problem. Um, again, if anyone has something to add or, or um, you know, wants to ask a question, please, please do unmute. I'd like, I'd like to have some intentional unmuting and not just background noise as well. Um, 
so that's you know from the perspective of the diaspora member themselves um, and you know you can also think about the developmental challenges and the opportunities from the perspective of the, um, the these different communities too so from the perspective of the community of origin um, you know that emigration can relieve pressure on um, on job markets when there is high unemployment um, you know there there is a, a good economic exchange to be made by um, exporting labor um, and then uh, two more productive um, parts of the world. Um, you know, there's, uh, and then also once uh, those members of the diaspora start contributing back home, that's when they also have that. There's that's another developmental opportunity to that community of origin, and that community of origin can, um, you know, benefit from the capital of their diaspora. Uh, they can benefit from, you know, both economic capital, social capital, you know networks and and trade connections and all of that um and and so on and so forth and then of course once they become a community of return uh you know they're benefiting from those skills and and other capitals coming back into the community too and there are negative um challenges as well uh you know when we talk about how when you do lose that human capital um you know you you know that that can also um uh, you know hold a community back um I, I feel in migration circles these days we we never talk about um brain drain anymore um and you know i think it's good to frame these things in a positive way um but you know they uh, there, there can be that those negative effects that communities of origin um, have to contend with as well. Okay, so I like to view diasporas as global assets in a networked world. And again, this is from the perspective, you know, when I say you, I'm talking about, um, you know, uh, governments um, of, of, of countries of origin or localities of origin. So diasporas are your community's assets dispersed across the globe. They're transnational enablers and agents of development. They're your ambassadors around the world as well. And they're part of your country or locality's global community. Um, you know, and these in some ways are, um, you know, uh, in some ways, uh, you know, I make these points to try and convince governments that to take this seriously and why it's really in their interest. You know, diaspora engagement is a is a huge opportunity. You have all these um, mini ambassadors floating about the world, um, and uh, they've they've made connections, they've acquired skills, they've acquired um, often acquired capital, and they they often do maintain those natural connections back home. So, you know, you, you, it's generally only a good thing to try and facilitate those connections and those movements and um, and those contributions that diasporas naturally make anyway. Um, and yes, the notion of identity is increasingly fluid. Diasporas comprise individuals and communities holding a variety of attachments and affinities to different places. Um, so that's also a, a, a point to make about how diaspora engagement is is generally um, non-competitive. You know, people have different um, identities and different affinities already within them. Um, and so those different places that they already have those affinities to have that opportunity to try and activate and, and, and um, you know, further facilitate those, um, those, those engagements that people want to make. All right. Any questions so far? Okay, we'll move on. So, uh, in summary, um, you know, diasporas, and we'll we'll tie this back together in the next slide in terms of the different capitals that diasporas transfer. Um, but diasporas, uh, you know, contribute in 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 many ways, including they send money home to fund basic goods and services, and help mitigate shocks and support recovery from crises. Uh, you know, there's a whole space, um, you know, the di di diaspora humanitarian engagement about how diasporas um, contribute, particularly in, in times of crisis. Uh, they invest money to improve lives, to make a financial return or often both. They share the skills, knowledge and contacts acquired from their experiences abroad. And they are the embodiment of their heritage community's image abroad, forging ties and creating transnational spaces. And we can think back to the um, Biden example of, of how that um, has taken place. 
Oh, we have our first question. How do governments change the perceptions of the diaspora community when they return? And if there are programs to assist in reintegration? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand your question, um, uh, Ahmed. Um, so how do governments change the perceptions of the diaspora community when they return? What kinds of perceptions do you, do you, are you referring to? Um, and, you know, why would government want to change them is, is my question back to you. Uh, and if there are programs to assist in reintegration, I'll talk more about some specific programs later. But the short answer is, yeah, there are many countries um, that, that are trying to facilitate, uh, certainly facilitate return and then some that are trying to, um, you know, also uh, cater for the kind of reintegration or address the reintegration challenges that that um, diaspora members often face when they do return, um, you know, either practical or or kind of community based um, community issues as well. OK, so you're, you're talking about um, uh, countries where um, locals uh, perceive diaspora communities as outsiders um so i mean i to be honest um I, you know i don't think governments really uh i haven't really come across governments that have put in place proper campaigns to try and change public opinion um but but what i have come across is governments that recognize that um there is there are those negative perceptions on the part of the of the homelands and um, that that those need changing in terms of the way that governments frame diaspora engagement, um, you know. So so, and uh, I'm just trying to think of think of some examples. But I'd also note that there that in with many governments that I've worked with, uh, it's not unusual for government officials to also harbor these um, sorts of views towards the diaspora. Um, you know, and and that's why, in some ways, um, you 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 have barriers to engagement that exist. You know, especially when we talk about um, dual citizenship. Uh, a lot of countries in the world, especially um, especially in Asia, but also in in certain European, African, and other countries, um, do not allow dual citizenship. Um, and I'll talk about this later. But I mean, something like dual citizenship is a no brainer for um for diaspora engagement you know in terms of unlocking the uh developmental benefits of diaspora engagement uh, but a lot of countries don't want to do it um and part of that is because there's this there's well both a fear that um diaspora members can have an influence on domestic elections and and um things like that uh but also just this sense that oh you've left your country you're 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 not loyal to the country so you don't deserve to keep um citizenship um, so, so yeah, uh, you know, this this is an issue that um, also affects governments who are making these decisions. Um, but I think framing diaspora engagement as um, um, in a positive way uh, can help to address these um, often misperceptions on the part part of the local population. Um, you know, framing diaspora engagement or framing your diaspora as you know. Um, uh, those who have left your country, but but who you are welcoming home warmly, you know, um, is is a good idea. Um, I know Morocco, for example, has a big um, uh, kind of uh, a program called Operation Marhaba, um, you know, welcoming back operation. So um, when Moroccans abroad come back to visit during major holidays to Morocco, um, they're welcomed at airports by dedicated, um, you know, volunteers. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of like a nice welcome. And that kind of frames the diaspora as, uh, you know, your ambassadors abroad who are coming back, um, you know, often uh, because they are they are part of your your nation. I hope that addresses your point, uh, Ahmed. Um, OK, so. Da, 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 da. Diaspora capital transfer. So um, diaspora capital transfer, this is just uh, a w one way of thinking about the ways that diasporas contribute to development. Um, you know, it's, it's it's a different way of thinking through what, what we've already discussed. Uh, but often people talk about diaspora capital transfer. Um, and there are four different types of diaspora capital transfer in this model. There's economic capital, human capital, social capital, and cultural 
international capital. And the idea is that diasporas transfer these different types of capital between their communities of residence, destination, um, and their community of origin. Um, and so economic capital, I think, is, is um, somewhat obvious. It's, it's the money, it's the remittances, it's investment back home. Um, it's, uh, it's philanthropy. Um, you know, there's uh, diaspora, diaspora often contribute um, to good causes back home. We saw that especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also during um, every humanitarian crisis that you can that you can imagine. Um, human capital, you know, uh, diasporas, they they um, transfer both the skills and knowledge that they acquired back home to their destination country. But then once they've acquired skills, training abroad, they they can um, also transfer that back home through trainings, uh, you know, temporary return through, um, you know, virtual uh, uh, trainings and, and, and many other ways. Social capital is often um, I feel social capital is probably the least concrete of, of the four types of capital that are often talked about. But um, it generally refers to those networks of relationships um, and it can also refer to, um, you know, the way that diaspora also engages with um, with their society back home too, um, and you know can also refer to the behaviours or the um, the mores that they transfer between their different communities too. Um, and then um, cultural capital uh, is that kind of rich and diverse background that transnational communities bring and new values and ideas. So um, you know we we can think about how um, the Indian diaspora in the UK has brought their excellent food, which is now embedded in into the UK, um, you know, and uh, and and the the verse, the richness of our societies that comes with having, um, you know, people come from different parts of the world and uh, bringing their their cultures with them. OK, and so so that's kind of um, uh, the part on how diasporas contribute to development. Now we'll talk a bit more about um, how we can actually, you know, frameworks for thinking about how as a country or a locality, how can we engage our diasporas? Um, so there's different ways of thinking about it. I'll share with you a few different frameworks that you can look up um, uh, and then I'll, I'll focus on just one framework so as not to um, muddy the waters too much. So... Um, one is the IOM, uh, the International Organization for Migration, the IOM, has their 3E strategy. It's kind of like engage, empower, um, what is it? Um, uh, da, 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 da. It's engage, empower, and something else. I don't know it so well because I don't actually think it's a very memorable framework, and I don't particularly use it myself. Um there's diaspora, the diaspora capital transfer model that I just described. Um, so looking specifically at how you engage those different um, capital transfers. Um, there's uh, the three T's. So looking at how you engage different um, types of uh, diaspora, um, how you engage the diaspora through, you know, using their time. So that's often when diaspora volunteer or how they might um, come back and do some trainings back home, uh, how you engage their, their treasure. So that would be their money, their remittances, philanthropy and so on, and how you engage their talent, um, you know, how you can encourage diaspora return and, and utilize the skills that, diaspora, that exist within the diaspora for the benefit of your home community. And then the the model that I, I often use um, is is kind of combines elements of different models and that's this kind of three pronged approach so um as a as a government you need to get to know your diaspora you need to build trust with them and then you need to find concrete ways of engaging them engaging their capital transfers so that's one um, that's the model i'm going to talk a bit more about um so the first part of that is to get to know your diaspora so uh does anyone have any um understanding or ideas about how do you actually collect diaspora data and also why would you collect diaspora data um, i just want to give you a moment to reflect on that and um yeah what what do you think if you got how to collect diaspora data um, and you can put them in the chat 
Yeah, IOM is a nice toolkit on diaspora mapping. I think uh, UNU Merit was uh, part of that, so it must be good. Um, yeah, so there's a toolkit on diaspora mapping, but but you know what what are some of the big ways that that the toolkit says you can um, collect diaspora data? Any ideas, guys? Or a, or a specific source of diaspora data, you know? Um, Facebook groups. Yeah, fa Facebook is actually, um, you know, when I've done a diaspora mapping myself, Facebook is like, um, uh, Facebook groups are such a great way to kind of um, uh, see, uh, to find community leaders, diaspora community leaders. Uh, so, so definitely agree, agree, agree that um, data can be collected at at the airports. Uh, yeah, you can, um, you can, uh, you know, as a country, as an immigration service, who, you know, as countries, um, either when when diaspora comes into the country or when they leave, you know, either through arrival cards or or departure cards at airports, you can get a sense of of, of who's from the diaspora, who's coming in from the diaspora. Um, so that's a good point as well by Gladys. Katrin's made a good point about using secondary data surveys, uh, big data, qualitative data. Yeah, you can actually do some pretty interesting stuff on um, Google Analytics um, to kind of understand, uh, you know, where people are searching for certain terms. Um, you know, so if, if there's a specific term, um, search term that you know is coming from that you know will come from your specific place or your specific community, um, then you can look at where those search terms are being searched from. You know, you can look at the different countries that those search terms are being searched from. You can also look the, uh, at, you know, uh, um, census data, and uh, you can look at, uh, you know, there's there's a whole field of research that tries to um, look at the origins of names, um, um, anyway, uh, so so to to kind of summarize it from the higher level, uh, you know, uh, in terms of diaspora research, I mean, often there are different ways of doing it. There's various types of of migration or diaspora profiles and mappings that you can develop. You know, dedicated studies on on your diaspora to really try and understand who are they, where are they, and what are what are they doing. Um, right. And the, the reason why you want to do this is, is well, there's there's the obvious point about um, policy can generally be better designed if it if it's informed by data, um, uh, you know, but also specifically with diaspora engagement, you often don't have, um, you know, just one singular diaspora. Uh, a diaspora often has many different diaspora segments. Um, and those diaspora segments might have different engagement needs, opportunities, and and challenges, uh, right? So you, you not only have your migrants living abroad, you might have um, you know generational differences. So both in terms of you know younger versus older um, diaspora members uh, might want to engage differently with their homeland, um, you know, and also lower skilled or, or um, lower skilled migrant workers may have different engagement needs, opportunities, challenges um, versus, you know, higher skilled, um, net, um, high net worth, uh, diaspora entrepreneurs, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, many different types of diaspora mappings and profiles that you can use. Uh, I've done diaspora mappings in the past, you know, using a lot of um, census data. Uh, that can be really useful when your um, diaspora tends to reside, if your diaspora tends to reside in a country that has advanced census data. Um, you know, I've done a lot of work on Pacific diasporas in Australia, and Australia has really um, kind of easy to use and extensive census data. Um, so yeah, and then and then of, to get that qualitative data, you can interview people, do focus groups, and and so on. Often getting to people through through Facebook groups and 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 so on, and using um, you know diaspora surveys, questionnaires, and um, yeah, many different ways to get diaspora data. Uh, and build building trust. Um, I'm going to try and go a bit quicker because I'm conscious of time, and I do want to leave a, a little bit of time for Q and A at the end, but. Um, 
when we want to build, when we talk talk about building trust, I think uh, uh, Ahmed um, uh, alluded to this earlier with his question. You know, there can often be these negative um, perceptions uh, from the local community of origin towards their diaspora. Um, and then also we've got to think about the reasons why diaspora may have moved. Um, in a lot of countries, uh, they have large diaspora populations because of um, specific reasons. And often, um, you know, these are uh, these come from very n negative events that have occurred. So when we talk about the Irish diaspora, there's such a large Irish diaspora um, in large part because of the um, Irish famine um, that occurred. Um, you know, there's uh, and, and with Fiji, uh, I worked a lot with the country of Fiji. Um, you know, a lot of the diaspora residing in Australia went there because there were several uh, political coups. There was a lot of instability in the country um, and a lot of people were persecuted because of their um, eth ethnicity. Um, and because of all of that taken together, what that means is that there's often a deficit of trust um, between the diaspora and between their, um, uh, their community of origin. Usually, you know, especially when we talk about the state. Um, and state engagement. So uh, states, you know, governments often do uh, need to build trust with their diaspora so that they will engage more with them, you know, and so that they can unlock those benefits of diaspora engagement. So um, uh, that's the kind of importance behind that. And so what we want to do with building trust is to increase the willingness of diasporas um, to participate in, in, um, uh, in diaspora engagement, to participate in diaspora engagement programs that governments may be wanting to facilitate. Um, and, you know, diasporas may feel that unique connection with their communities of origin. Uh, but they may have those complex relationships um, with their communities back home, especially with state institutions, as I said. Um, so governments often need to develop sustained and differentiated converse conversations with different diaspora communities. Um, and that's that's uh, something which um, I find governments uh, often struggle with. Um, you know, they don't want to. Um, uh, necessarily take that conciliatory tone. They don't necessarily want to say uh, sorry for for um, things that which happened in the past. Um, and also, many diaspora communities um, uh, are uh, opposed to the uh, incumbent their incumbent governments. So there's that adds another layer of politics to this too. Um, I've also made this point in the in the slide um, uh, of two way engagement. Um, you know, often building trust is about showing, you know, from the perspective of government, building trust is also about showing the diaspora that you care about their problems and that, and that you want to, um, you know, that you're concerned about their welfare and that you want to improve their lives. Um, you know, a lot of the diaspora engagement um, interventions out there are about trying to get more money from the diaspora, to be uh, frank, you know, but that that can turn diaspora off, um, you know. So two-way engagement is critical in, in, in building trust. Um, so if you look at the Irish diaspora strategy, you know, there's a lot on there about um, di Irish diaspora welfare, you know, whether it's helping um, the Irish diaspora who might be in, um, fi who may find themselves in an irregular migration status uh, in the US or elsewhere, or supporting Irish um, LGBTQ rights um, abroad. You know that those kinds of things are are touched on the Irish diaspora diaspora strategy, um, and also another kind of um, f uh, what what may sound like a trivial issue. Um, you know, when I was working with Fiji, one big thing that comes up with the Fijian diaspora uh, and also other Pacific diasporas is their access to kava. Kava is a root um, that that is usually brewed into a drink that a lot of Pacific Islanders use for social occasions um and so getting access to that was a big um, pain point for the for a lot of pacific diasporas and government can step in and try to um you know make that access easier to to show that they care about the diaspora's concerns as well um and so more concretely um other than that two-way engagement you know, building trust is also about creating spaces where um, both diaspora, different diaspora communities can come together, um, you know, because often we find that diaspora communities are may also um, uh, 
be affected by division and and um, infighting and so on. Um, and then also state diaspora engagement spaces as well. Um, so we talked about get to know your diaspora, build trust with them, and then engage them. And there's different ways you can engage them concretely. Um, import, what's important um, is, is to, well, the, the, when we talk about the policy level, um, so I think in the last 20 years, you've seen this proliferation of diaspora policies and institutions around the world. Um, both at the national level and subnational level. Um, so here we're talking about, um, you know, uh, governments either uh, developing specific national diaspora policies, um, or developing, uh, you know, a, a diaspora directorate within their Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or in some cases a, a ministry for the diaspora in in, in some countries as well. Um, and then also we see. Um, apologies for some background noise. I, I have a, a sick baby um, in my in my home who couldn't go to daycare today. Um, you know, and then we also have uh, some countries that develop perhaps a national migration policy, which may have a diaspora component within it, or we have a country that develops a foreign policy with a diaspora um, component within it. Um, and so uh, I'll also I'll just point out a few policies that I find interesting. Um, so I quite like the Irish national diaspora strategy. Um, I like the uh, Welsh uh, the Welsh diaspora action plan. So that's by the government of Wales. Um, and I, I like those two strategies because uh, they're very short and to the point. Um, a lot of countries develop policies that are, are much longer and more detailed, whereas I quite like policies where a government specifically says this is what we will do for the diaspora. Um, but there are examples of diaspora policies from around the world, Kosovo, Albania, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, I believe, um, I think Benin. I'm just naming some of the countries that that people are diasporas of uh, in this seminar. Um, and, you know, I know they have diaspora um, strategies. Um, and then also, uh, when we get down to the programmatic level, there's a whole range of programs that uh, governments have either designed or facilitated that engage different forms of economic, social, human capital and cultural capital transfer. Um, I know we're running out of time. I'll just give a, a quick overview of some of those. Um, and uh, we'll find a way to share these slides as well afterwards um, so that you can uh, look more into these. Um, but when we look at uh, di diaspora economic capital programs, um, you know, there's a whole range of programs that aim, aim to facilitate uh, remittances. Um, there's a whole body of work as well designed to try and uh, make remittances easier, cheaper and so on. Um, you know, remittances is often the most concrete and um, most obvious way that diasporas contribute, um, you know, and so if you can uh, knock a few percentage points off of the cost of sending those remitt remittances. Um, you can unlock more of those transfers for the community of origin. Um, there's a whole range of programs that are designed to increase uh, trade and investment from the diaspora. Um, so these can be uh, government vehicles like Nigeria has um, issued a diaspora bond, which was quite um, which was quite uh, well kind of received and and is known for being a pretty good practice. Uh, governments can also set up diaspora funds. Um, private private companies can also set up funds to channel um, funds from the diaspora into investments back home. Uh, there's an initiative called ZD Circle, Z I D I Circle, as well, which tries to um, uh, channel diaspora investment into um, kind of early startups across Africa. Um, uh, what else is worth mentioning? There's a whole area of diaspora entrepreneurship that tries to kind of link diaspora um, uh, diaspora in Europe or other high income countries um, back to their kind of communities of origin to start businesses or to support others to start businesses. Um, what else? Uh, we also have diaspora human capital transfer programs, um, either temporary or um, or permanent. Uh, return programs where diaspora can kind of go back home for a while and either lecture in a university or um, conduct trainings or, um, you know, uh, develop um, uh, educational exchanges um, or, you know, go back to their home university and uh, do a collaborative research project. Um, 
uh, and these days, especially with with the the power of the internet, uh, you know, a lot of this can be done virtually. So diaspora mentorship has um, become quite a prominent theme as well. Oh, and there's also a lot of um, uh, permanent return programs out there too that try to encourage diaspora members to return home permanently. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, in Portugal. Portugal has had a, um, a return program called Programa uh, Regressar, uh, where it provides a comprehensive support package to um, members of the Portuguese diaspora who are looking to return. Um, and then there are uh, other programs. I think Mauritius has a return program as well, uh, also trying to provide a mixture of, um, you know, reintegration support and um, tax breaks or, or, or other incentives to uh, encourage their diaspora to move back home. Uh, diaspora social capital. So here often, um, as I said, it's a bit of a wishy-washy category, but, um, you know, I think the biggest things here are about uh, the biggest things in diaspora engagement are removing barriers to engagement. And the biggest barriers are things like um, dual citizenship. Uh, and so there's a whole range of, of interventions that governments can adopt, uh, not only if, if not only dual, allowing dual citizenship, which is the most obvious one, but also um, kind of allowing temporary residence cards and so on. Um, and then at the more extreme end uh, is kind of diaspora representation in government, in legislatures. Uh, some countries have allowed um, diaspora to elect uh, members of parliament. Uh, I'm thinking about France, for example, Senegal. Uh, they actually have um, parliamentarians who represent diaspora constituencies abroad. Um, and there's a whole area of, of encouraging the development of diaspora networks as well. Oh, I'm really uh, seeing how I'm short on time. Um, I'll I'll kind of uh, make sure that we get these slides to you so you can also see some of the um, cultural programs that are there to try and cultivate that sense of belonging. Um, things like uh, Israel's birthright program um, have long tried to encourage uh, young members of the diaspora to, to, to come back home for a while, uh, come back to their country of heritage to uh, try and foster those those affinities and connections. And then there's, you know, promoting one's language abroad amongst the diaspora as well, especially the later generations. And there's a lot of stuff around sport um, as well. Anyway, um, yeah, I will uh, get to the questions then. There's a whole lot of diaspora policy lessons learned that I would like to have covered, but um, didn't get time to today. And also in the slides, I'll also just point out that I've included a lot of different resources. Um, here you can see these resources on policy applications. So these are some different uh, publications that I and others have worked on that try to bring together some of the different practices around the world to engaging diasporas. Um, and then I've included a lot of kind of more academic um, uh, references uh, at the end as well. You know, there's a, as I'm sure many of you know, there's a whole body of research about um, about the, the the linkages between diasporas and development as well. Anyway, um, thank you very much for for listening. I appreciate your time, and I'd love to receive any questions that you may have if if time allows. Of course, um, we like if if you have another appointment for the participants. Yes, please feel free to drop uh, a message. And if you don't have time to receive the answer, I could email it to you. Otherwise, feel free to either use the raise the hand uh, function or drop uh, your message in the chat and Loxan then can take a look at it. Any questions? I see. A question from Kylian Bernard uh, in the chat box. There is often a concentration of motivating the return to the to countries of origin. Are the examples for motivating a move to different countries of destination? Uh, so I'm not quite sure I, I understand your your question. Um, do, you, do you mean there's a, a focus on trying to encourage the return to countries of origin um is, is that what you mean yeah um well in diaspora engagement you know we're talking about um in, encouraging 
you know, we're, we're mainly talking about how do we encourage our diasporas to um, re return to the community of origin, right? That that's that's the perspective of of diaspora engagement. Um, I would, I mean, um, encouraging people to move to different countries of destination. Um, I would say is more, uh, you know, it's, it's more about labor migration and exporting labor to certain countries. So there's a whole range of um, uh, interventions where countries have tried to encourage um, uh, the export of their own labor, their own migrant workers to specific countries through, you know, specific, um, you know, bilateral labor agreements or, or otherwise. But, um, you know, here we're talking about very much how can a country engage its diaspora um, so here we're talking about the focus is on on encouraging the return of one's diaspora to the community of origin. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay. I do not see anyone raising their hand. Oh, okay. Emmanuel just dropped a message. So if weighing the gains and pains of diaspora, can we say that diaspora is a blessing or a challenge to the development of origin countries? Well, diaspora, I, I think, is purely an opportunity, really. Um, uh, and the, and I say that um, in contrast to saying migration is purely a, a, an opportunity. My, and, and that's also what's kind of good when we talk about diaspora engagement. We are generally talking about you know how can we engage our diasporas, right? And we want to engage our diasporas for 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 positive reasons, right? To for for positive impacts. So you know migration as a whole, I think is is um you know comes with opportunities and challenges for origin communities, as as I mentioned in that um that slide about the the developmental opportunities and challenges at different stages of the um of the migration cycle. But when we talk about diaspora engagement. You know, um, it, it sure you can talk about um, challenges like uh, you know your diaspora can. Well, th there's often misperceptions about how diaspora can you know um, uh, unduly uh, influence um, you know domestic issues that that don't impact them, or um, you know, uh, or that diaspora can transmit um, uh, you know negative uh, behaviors or, or things like that, but. Generally speaking, those are um, not um, kind of real credible uh, challenges. Um, so, so generally, for an origin community, uh, you know, you have to see your diaspora as an opportunity. You know, if you've got members of your community who are living um, uh, elsewhere, you know, it's for you to see them as an opportunity to engage with them. If you see what I mean. Any other questions? Thank you, Gabriel. Okay. Oh, please comment on the refugees in protracted situation as diaspora. Um, so, uh, well, I, I'll, I'll comment. Um, you know, if you've got a specific question, feel free to ask. But uh, I mean, refugees are mem. You know, I would consider them members of their diaspora. Um, you know, of their country's diaspora or their locality's diaspora. Again, this point about uh, the definition of diaspora is that it's it, a lot of the definition hinges on the diaspora member themselves as identifying with their country of origin. But, you know, um, uh, generally speaking, you know, there's no the 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 migration status, the, uh, one's migration status doesn't determine uh, whether or not they are um part of a diaspora right so it's more about their identity um you know generally as as a as a migrant uh, or as a descendant of a migrant of a particular place any other questions
Yeah, maybe with that, I will first start with thanking you very much, Roxanne, for always making the time to be part of our seminar series. You're always super keen to tailor uh, the content for our uh, participants, so thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to hosting you in another seminar series, perhaps. For the participants, thank you very much for uh, your attendance. And uh, please always keep an eye on our events page on the UNU Merit website for our upcoming seminar series. We try to host from one to two seminars monthly. Um, I will, um, for uh, I think, Loxan, you mentioned sharing the PowerPoint presentation, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, well, if you're interested, because some of you uh, are not affiliated per se to our uh, institute, if you are interested in receiving it, please reach out to me uh, via mail and um, via my email, and I'll make sure to get the PowerPoint presentation for you. Otherwise, you can just wait a week or so, and you will find also the recording of the seminar uh, on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you very uh, much for having a me. great rest of the week. Thank you, Luxan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay, bye. -bye. bye.